The Mummy, a 1999 action thriller about a group of heroes who go up against an undead foe wielding unspeakable power. As a kid, it was one of my favorite movies. It had the perfect blend of action, suspense, and comedy. And growing up in the early 2000s with a VHS copy, I watched it so many times that the tape itself is probably mummified. It's a love letter to the classic horror B-movies of old, and as such proved very successful, spawning sequels, spin-offs, and even its very own animated series. And since it's spooky season, I thought what better time than to finally tackle the video games? Because believe me when I say, this this is one of those IPs with a ton of them. So let's start from the top with The Mummy on PS1. Released also for Microsoft Windows, it was developed by Rebellion, who were best known for their Alien vs. Predator games, and published by Konami, who didn't suck yet. And if you've seen the movie, you already know the story. Three heroes descend into an ancient tomb and mistakenly resurrect a long-dead super mummy named Imhotep. The game more or less follows the film's overall plot, though takes a few creative liberties here and there. As Rick O'Connell, it's your job to explore its 15 or so levels whilst you collect ancient treasures and battle droves of the undead. But it isn't just mummy you have to worry about, as each level is also booby-trapped to hell. There are pillars that'll crush ya, pits that'll trap ya, and doors that'll smash ya. The first thing you immediately notice is the tank controls. Now, these were a staple of the survival horror genre, which you could easily place this game into. I mean, it's got it all. Darkness, cramped spaces, resource management, but it also has an ungodly amount of platforming, which is near impossible thanks to the stiff jumping. As soon as you leave the ground, you're locked into a trajectory that can only be slightly corrected, and every leap made is accompanied by a held breath since if you aren't entirely perfect, you're going into a pit. You can grab ledges, but only when your weapon is put away, and even then, it's better to aim for the platform itself if you can help it. The biggest comparison you can draw would have to be that of Tomb Raider. Both have the same control scheme with characters who run and jump, not to mention go all guns akimbo, but the difference is that the first Tomb Raider released nigh on four years before. During a time when the blueprint for not just 3D platformers, but 3D games as a whole was still being drawn. That's a lot of time to evaluate and assess things, and while Laura Croft is fondly remembered for her acrobatics, it's in spite of the frustration they brought along. It's like either commit to making a survival horror with tank controls, or spring for a bombastic Mario-like platformer. This came out in 2000! Even Croc had ditched his roots by then. On the topic of Tomb Raider, it'd be six years later developer Core Design would be acquired by none other than Rebellion, and as most of you probably know, Tomb Raider would serve as a major inspiration for Naughty Dog's Uncharted series, which is funny since if you squint your eyes really hard, this looks like a 32-bit Nathan Drake. The main drive is collecting star keys so you can reach the end of levels and get your hands on MacGuffins to progress the story. It's along the way you collect treasures, solve puzzles, and blast monsters, all the while music from the film plays. You start out with a simple torch that's handy for lighting the dark, as well as O'Connell's twin revolvers, but pick up even greater weapons along the way. Swords, shotguns, dynamite, machine guns, hell, you can even use your fists. All that's missing are some chairs to throw. The craziest are the amulets, which kill every enemy in one hit, but come with a catch. Remember all of those treasures you can collect? Four of those make up one amulet, and depending on whether or not you're a completionist like myself, you can either have a ton of these or none at all. This goes hand in hand with the star keys, which along with opening doors, serve as a sort of marker as to whether or not you've done everything in an area. This includes picking up items, killing enemies, and lighting wall hieroglyphs, which is also how you collect extra lives. Score Scoring a perfect zone, as the game calls it, is not nearly as easy as it may seem. In just about every game with collectibles, you're liable to miss a good amount, but here, where there is literal gold on gold, the chances of glossing over them skyrocket. And if you are unlucky enough to have missed something, you better not pass through any checkpoints, since they block you from going back. What's even crazier is the manual. See, it's a PS1 game, so there's a ton of stuff in there, and if you turn to page 10, you'll find that- no! You must not read from the book! There's no bigger pain in the ass than when the game tries to get creative by forcing you to do stuff. Surfing, being chased by hazards, these sections have the same issue as the overall platforming, but since they can't be avoided, score way higher on the misery index. 
A close second would have to be the side-scrolling level where you chase Benny. O'Connell's jump is absolutely horrid, whether it's the already mentioned trajectory, arc, or combination of both with the shoddiest hitbox in the history of the universe. I'd say this level is good for scoring easy one-ups, but that'd be a complete lie since you're lucky to leave with more than you already had. The only one of these I didn't hate was the Anaxuna Moon boss, mostly because it's an almost Pac-Man-like stage where the goal is lighting up every floor tile, and that's pretty hard to screw up. It throws me for a loop how well this game works as a survival horror, but is absolutely atrocious whenever it tries anything else. It's got the atmosphere, it's got the controls, it's even got the uncanny graphics. There's there's a serious PS1 Hagrid thing going on with everybody. Like, did they really have to do Brendan Fraser this oh. dirty? And did they then have to double down with that life icon? Overall, it isn't the worst PS1 game I've ever played, but in the grand scheme of survival horror, platformers, or both put together, you could do a whole lot better. Not only would the game release on PS1 and PC, but there'd also be a Game Boy Color port developed by Konami themselves. Almost Lost Vikings-like, this is a side-scroller that sees you controlling one of many characters, being Evie, Jonathan, O'Connell, or Ardeth Bay, as you run around and solve puzzles. Each of them has their own unique abilities, like being able to jump far, use dynamite, shoot guns, or hack and slash with a sword, and figuring out who to use when is the name of the game. But there really isn't much to say it's a solid puzzle platformer with some pretty good brain twisters, and in true GBC fashion, it's got quite a few rock and 8-bit tunes. It isn't the most graphically impressive game to have released on the handheld, but it is harmless, and for that, you've gotta appreciate what was done here. Besides, what other game has a cutscene as unintentionally funny as this? Next up is The Mummy Returns on PS2. As a kid, this seemed like one of the coolest games ever made, and the reason being is laughable in retrospect. See, it had a really cool trailer. And yeah, the whole draw of it is that you can either play as Rick or Imhotep, effectively choosing between good and evil. Regardless of who you choose, the gameplay is akin to that of a 3D Zelda with button prompts on the screen and a limited camera that can be snapped into place. Unlike any of Nintendo's classics, however, there's no Z targeting, which makes the combat a chore. You can do this weird type of aiming thing with the right stick that changes where you face, and characters do their best to lock on to whichever enemy is closest, but without a dedicated means of zoning in, it all feels very sloppy. Not only that, but everyone runs away, which effectively discourages you from using any melee weapons as you fall back on guns that hit from almost anywhere. But Imhotep doesn't use guns, opting to instead use magic spells that can sap life from dazed enemies, resurrect dead allies, buff attacks, and even outright kill dudes in one hit. It's clear from the get-go who the cooler of the two is, and while I'm sure playing as Imhotep was a definite afterthought, given how the levels are just reused and played from end to beginning, it's neat being able to make use of his powers. The trade-off is that, with the exception of soul-sucking, every one of them draws from his health, which causes his body to decompose. There also isn't nearly as much enemy variety as when you play as O'Connell. There you fight mummies and red turbans, but as Imhotep, the majority of enemies you fight are Magi who all look the same. Even the bosses aren't as dynamic, as with the exception of Rick and the Scorpion King at the very end, you fight Ardeth Bay four times, and each of them is exactly the same. In the original Boris Karloff film, Ardeth Bay is an alias used by Imhotep, so here it's almost like he's fighting himself, kicking his own ass time and time again. Of course, both campaigns share a few enemy types like pygmy mummies, but at that point, you're so over the repetitive combat, you're likely gunning for the level's end without any other care. Still, there are a few levels I'm glad to have experienced as Imhotep, like Cairo. As Rick, this is a pretty boring level where you have to collect coins, but during an Imhotep playthrough, the city is crawling with not only Magi, but also cats. If you've seen the first movie, you know Imhotep fears cats since they're the guardians of the 
underworld, and here is no exception. The little bastards start attacking him with brain lasers, and the only way to get rid of him is with ancient Egyptian animal abuse. Now, as someone who loves cats, I would never condone this type of activity, but since it's within a controlled environment in a video game, I have to say, it's funny as hell. This is an all-powerful mummy man going around kicking the shit out of cats. Still, the game is pretty weak. It's boring, uninspired, and its cardinal sin is having no checkpoints. Lest you want to restart levels upon death, you have to manually save in the pause menu, and since dying is as easy as getting swarmed by one too many enemies or falling into an insta-death, having to do it again and again and again is unbearable. There also aren't any visual aids that guide you through levels. No clever item or enemy placement that makes you go, oh, I should walk that way. Somehow, even the most straightforward ones are maze-like like with no logic whatsoever. You might be looking at this compass thinking that helps, but no. It points you in the general direction of where you need to go, sure, but it doesn't tell you whether that's above or below where you are. And the map? Well, let's just say it isn't only Zelda receiving a black eye here, as this abstract mess would make even the most hardened Metroid fans cry their eyes out. Who developed this anyway? Blitz Games? Wow. They really improved after this. Honestly, if you want a good 3D Zelda with mummies, look no further than Sphinx. Not even the film score can save this slog fest, since its OST is made up of original music. I ragged on the first game quite a bit, but one thing you can count on is awesome music playing while you mow down walking corpses. Here though, it just isn't the same. <laughs> At least the character models look good. Sure, their mouths don't move when they talk, but it says a lot when video game Scorpion King looks better than movie Scorpion King. Speaking of, the Scorpion King himself would also receive a few games, both on console and GBA. But since I don't really want to talk about those at all... Yeah, no, on to the next one. Much like before, The Mummy Returns would also release on Game Boy Color with Game Brains at the helm. A traditional platformer, this one sees you running from left to right, and sometimes right to left, as you fight enemies and avoid hazards. There's a definite improvement with the graphics, namely smoother animations, but as a whole, it's pretty basic. Again, I don't have much to say. It's a GBC game from 2001 with alright music and subpar gameplay. It attempts a sort of Resident Evil Gaiden thing with first-person stages, but man, it's just not that interesting. Thankfully, the Game Boy Advance has us covered with The Mummy, the animated series. Because yeah, back in the early 2000s, there was a TV show. And even though it's been a while, I remember it being pretty cool. Focusing more on the O'Connell's son, Alex, it was a globe-trotting Saturday morning cartoon that saw the family searching for the Lost Scrolls of Thebes, all the while being hunted by Imhotep. It's only natural that a video game adaptation would be made, and it'd be our friends at Ubisoft leading the charge. Rather than making another side-scroller, they'd instead spring for an adventure game, complete with a bird's-eye view and pseudo-3D visuals. You can swap between all three O'Connells on the fly, as each have their own strengths and weaknesses. Alex is the quickest and can open on chests. He has the weakest regular attack, but is able to use the Manacle of Osiris to cast magic spells, which do a pretty good job taking care of enemies. Eevee can perform combat rolls that allow her to clear booby-trapped floors, as well as decipher hieroglyphs that provide useful information. Her fighting skills are also much better, being able to not only hit things from a distance with sticks, but also the quickest, which makes her ideal for scoring high combos. Rick is the slowest of the three, but makes up for it all the same. He's the strongest, which not only lets him pull pull levers and push boulders, but can charge his punches, which allows him to take down most enemies in one or two blows. He's also the only one who can use dynamite, which is essential for blasting open walls. The amount of synergy at play is incredible, not only because levels are expertly crafted to accommodate the mechanics, but also because switching between the three keeps things fresh. No one O'Connell can make their way through a dungeon alone, as each of them serve a very important purpose, which means when one of them dies, it fucking sucks. Thankfully, you can resurrect fallen characters at specially marked platforms, but to do that, you've got to have the requisite coinage, which is also used to purchase health and magic vials. This is a good game. My only complaint is that it's short. There are four levels, each of which only take about an hour or so to complete depending on how well you handle the puzzles, and with how good everything was, I couldn't help but find myself wishing for more. 
And how much more can you get than a PlayStation 2 game? Developed by French studio Asobo, this is a fully 3D action-adventure title released in 2004, one year after the show had ended. There's just one problem. This version was only ever available in Europe, and since I don't own a copy, nor do I have the appropriate means to play it on actual hardware, there's no way for me to talk about it. On console, that is. Because it also released on PC, but that version too is very hard to track down thanks to it being so ill-preserved, and even if you do manage to find it, surprise, it's in Polish. I did, however, manage to get my hands on it in a language I understand, so this is what we're going to be working with for the time being. The only downside is, it's one of those games where the physics are tied to its frame rate, so if you want to play at a speed that isn't on par with 3D Sonic, you've got to limit the FPS. Then, if you want to use a controller, you have to map the buttons, but even then there's no guarantee it'll work. Let's just say it'd be less of a pain to find actual mummies than it is to get this game up and running. So here we are in Egypt where... What's happening? Why aren't their mouths moving? I suppose I should mention that this game released with a super aggressive DRM called Star Force. Intrusive, annoying, and having no compatibility with modern operating systems, this protection software was notorious for doing a bunch of shady things in the background that led to a plethora of issues like driver errors, blue screens, and random reboots. As such, if you want to play this game without a disc, you have to install a crack, but one of the downsides of that is it breaks any and all of the game's dialogue right down to the mouth animations. Still, it's a whole lot better than filling your PC with spyware. Now, this is easily the best 3D game here, and for good reason. It doesn't suck. Obviously, it goes deeper than that, but the point still stands. One, it isn't a slave to tank controls, nor does it attempt to make them work in a platforming setting, and two, it doesn't play like a bastardized Zelda game. Instead, it does its own thing while adopting a myriad of tried-and-true mechanics, leading to a legitimately fun platformer with puzzles. Unlike the GBA game, here you only play as Alex, who's capable of fighting enemies hand-to-hand -hand, as well as with a slingshot, but is also able to manipulate objects with the manacle of Osiris, whether it's simply levitating and throwing them, or imbuing them with the powers of ice, fire, or electricity. The bracelet also grants him with the Eye of Ra, which is a sort of Batman Arkham detective vision that reveals secrets, and there's even a shield power much later in the game. Like its handheld counterpart, it too is considerably short, but manages to strike a pretty even balance thanks to a healthy amount of exploration and difficulty. Many of the puzzles are as straightforward as just finding buttons to push or wall inserts to shoot, but there are also quite a few that call for clever placement of objects and even the assist of Alex's pet mongoose, Tut. This little guy can be ordered around with the push of a button, and while the majority of the time he does exactly as he's told, there were a few instances where I found him to be absolutely broken. There's this spot in the Kingdom of the Dead that calls for him to be levitated atop a block, and I have no idea what his issue was, but the little dude just refused to hop on and even plunged to his death a few times. It makes you wonder, if you die in the Kingdom of the Dead, where do you go? The enemies can also be pretty tough. Some of them have elemental powers and are therefore defeated by their opposite. Fire for ice, ice for fire, and even electricity for... Electricity. Sure. With all of the damn mummies in these games, you'd expect me to have a real hatred for them, but no, it's ghosts I never want to see again. Especially here, what with how they pursue you endlessly and take forever to kill, which wouldn't be nearly as much of a problem if you didn't need to kill them to progress. Still, I'd take any of this over the previous nonsense. The controls are good, the level design makes sense, and would you believe it, a map that looks like a map. Sure, the bats make really annoying buzzing sounds, and there was also a cutscene where Evie kept, uh, yeah, doing that. But I stand by it when I say this is a solid game from a solid developer who'd go on to do great things. Numerous Pixar tie-ins, a Plague Tale, and even the 2020 version of Microsoft Flight Simulator. See, French people aren't all that bad. But, uh, when you talk about bad and the mummy, only one thing comes to mind. The third film. 
Don't get me wrong, it isn't the worst in the series, because yeah, we'll be getting there very soon, but compared to the first two, it was just unnecessary. Something that can also be said about its video game counterpart, which released on both the PS2 and Wii. So, Tomb of the Dragon Emperor. This was developed by Euricom and released the same year as the film, 2008, which of course follows the O'Connells as they travel to China to fight not mummies. And if you're thinking that sounds redundant, you should see the game. It's more of a third-person shooter than a platformer, prioritizing gunplay overall, though there are many moments that feel like they came straight out of Uncharted. Just when you think the Nathan Drake comparison couldn't get any worse, it hits you like a goddamn sarcophagus. The story is comprised of six levels, each going on way longer than they have any right to. Switching between Rick and Alex, the loop is made up mostly of combat, whether melee or gun-based, as well as platforming and solving puzzles. The intro cutscene utilizes footage straight from the film, but it's in incredibly choppy, almost crossing into FMV territory. Compare this to the PS1 game, and yeah, the quality is lesser there, but it makes sense. It's a game from 2000 running on a console released in the mid-90s. This, however, came out eight years later on infinitely more powerful hardware and manages to somehow look just as bad. Maybe that's why the rest of them are presented as animatics. Anyway, you can use light, strong, and grapple attacks to dispatch bad guys in addition to pistols, machine guns, shotguns, and grenades. The combat is maddening. Not only is every room a guaranteed mini-arena with enemies attacking in waves, but there's really no nuance to any of it. You can of course mix things up with light and strong attacks, but it's far easier to just spam until everyone's down. The guns aren't any better. Hold L1 to lock onto targets and do the same with R1 to shoot. The seemingly endless enemies get old very quick, and the worst among them are the guys who lob grenades, which magically hit you no matter where you are. I even stood below one, and lo and behold, it hit me through the ground. If you think that's bad, the shit really hits the fan at Mach 10 once the Terracotta Warriors show up, thanks to these annoying shield guys and crossbow dudes who can shoot you through walls. Still, that isn't anything compared to the piss-awful platforming. You know how I compared this to Uncharted earlier? Well, that wasn't hyperbole. In fact, it was an unwarranted insult, as Mummy 3 over here has some of the weakest wall climbing I've ever seen in a game. It's like a half-functional Assassin's Creed parkour system with janky animations and hazards that kill you automatically. Fun. And I'm really happy I sprung for the PS2 port, because I can only imagine how obnoxious these puzzles are with motion controls. And yeah, that's right, I said puzzles. Every one of them boils down to moving the left and right sticks to activate things. Guess it's better than flailing your arms around? I don't fucking know. I got to this spot in level 2 where you have to find a ladder release, and within the same area, not even 10 feet away, I found the thing. Phew, that was a close one. I'm really lucky I was able to figure it out. This is just a bad game. Not only is a movie tie-in, but also is everything it attempts and fails to emulate. Shooting, climbing, god-awful turret sections. Yeah, those are here too. And the boss fights are abysmal. Point and shoot, root toot toot! The only thing that doesn't suck is when you get to play as a yeti, which is hilarious considering that was the dumbest part of the whole film. Speaking of dumb, what say we take a look at the DS port? Oh. God. Please. No! It isn't often I'm almost entirely against playing a game for a video, but when it's guaranteed to be a decayed piece of licensed shovelware trash, every fiber of my being tells me, no, commands me to do anything else. Developed by Artificial Mind and Movement, otherwise known as A2M, or better yet, ass to mouth, this is somehow better than the console versions, yet simultaneously worse. I'd make some yin-yang joke, but honestly, I feel like it's much too on the nose, thanks to it not only being about Chinese mythology, but also releasing on the DS. And that's right! All of the fun from the console game can be had on the go with just a fraction of the resolution. Naturally, it'd go on to receive rave reviews like that of Pocket Gamer UK's. Typical shabby movie tie-in that will have you running for your mummy. That's pretty good, but since I'm American, I'll feign confusion. The one that takes the cake is easily GameSpots, who remarked that it's only slightly less painful than getting your brain removed through your nose. Real talk, I wish I could summarize games in a single sentence. It had cut down on production time, leaving me to play more gems like The Mummy, Tomb of the Dragon Emperor on Nintendo DS. Jesus, this video's long. 
Anyway, this is a 3D, I'm using that term very lightly, action adventure romp with touchscreen puzzles. Here, the stylus is used to memorize Chinese characters, but instead of being able to simply jot them down, it's like you're using an actual quill with ink. You have to dip the pen every time, but it isn't a simple dip, no, no. It's the most vicious ink fucking imaginable as you hatefully plunge in and out. The touchscreen's also used to shoot guns, which is just as awkward. There isn't a targeting system, meaning you almost have to imagine where you're aiming in relation to the top screen, and though there is unlimited ammo, reloading can take a while. If there's one thing it gets right, it's the environments. They're all surprisingly detailed, though I'm not sure if the same could be said about the characters, but hey, you can't have it all. Sadly, that also includes fun, because even though this isn't nearly as much of a trial as the PS2 game, playing through its repetitive levels is like trying to conquer China pointless. With basic puzzles, annoying time restraints, and amateur at best voice acting, this here DS title earned its rightful place in bargain bins all around the world. And I truly, with all of my heart, don't want to talk about it anymore. But as unnecessary as Tomb of the Dragon Emperor was, it'd be nine years later the series would be rebooted with 2017's The Mummy, an adventure so devoid of any spirit it single-handedly put the Dark Universe six feet under before it even had a chance to exist. <laughs> Christ, man, what the hell do you even call that, a super abortion? But believe it or not, the worst Mummy movie would actually make way for quite possibly one of the best games, as the way forward developed Mummy Demastered would prove to be a hell of a Metroidvania. You play as a nameless soldier under the command of Dr. Jekyll, who's tasked with stopping the undead Princess Aminette from taking over the world. Making use of guns and explosives, it's up to you to defeat the forces of darkness by exploring and securing locations. It's got a badass prologue that sets the tone perfectly. You descend into an ancient crypt when disaster strikes, leading to a mad dash that can either result in you escaping or becoming one of the undead, as the coolest mechanic is introduced. Depending on how good you are at surviving, you you might play as multiple nameless soldiers, with each new one having to locate the previous to get their items. This makes way for some truly stressful moments, as any enemy could see you having to begin again, so you're constantly on the lookout for save rooms just in case. The starting weapon is an MP5, which is a real pea shooter, but has unlimited ammo, making it ideal for taking care of small fry. You go on to procure a variety of much stronger weapons, like an assault rifle, flamethrower, cluster rockets, and even a plasma beam, though so they all take actual ammo, which starts out pretty low, but is increased by collecting bandoliers. You can also expand your overall health, as well as get your hands on scrolls that bestow you with all new abilities, like being able to hang from ceilings, run faster, jump higher, and even walk underwater. Dr. Jekyll periodically calls in to give the lowdown on things, but aside from that, it's all on you to figure out what's up as you fight monsters and blow up walls. And though there is an arsenal of guns and grenades to choose from, you can only carry three at a time, adding a nice bit of strategy as you mix and match weapons for higher effectiveness. In terms of overall gameplay, I'd say it embraces Metroid far more than it does Castlevania. However, when it comes to theming, the latter's influence is undeniable, what with a collection of gothic locations and spooky monsters to fight, like bats, wolves, and mummies. You've also got to appreciate it for keeping the tried-and-true annoying skeleton trope alive, whether it's rib-throwing or just flying around as flaming skulls. You also fight so many spiders, you'll wish you had either a can of Raid or a giant shoe to throw at them. It's a good thing they burn, just like everything else. Only, it's much quicker paced than any Metroid, at least as far as I can tell, so it can be a bit tricky since it's so easy to look at and think of Super Metroid or AM2R, but once you get the hang of rolling out of the way and later phase dashing, it's all smooth sailing. It's just nice to have a horror-themed game that looks and plays like this. Don't get me wrong, I love Metroid Fusion, and Dread was phenomenal, but it took almost 20 years to make, and in that time, what else did we have? Aliens Infestation, which was also made by WayForward? That's honestly all I can think of, but if you know of any other games that fit the bill, be sure to let me know. It all culminates in a battle against not only the mummy herself, but also the Egyptian god of death, Set. And depending on how many times you've died, there are actually three different endings to unlock. No deaths at all gets you the best, while dying before and during the final boss sees the normal taking place. The worst and most fitting is achieved by not surviving the final escape, where Dr. Jekyll laments the sacrifices made. Don't quote me, but I'm pretty sure this was inspired by how bad the movie flopped. 
I think that just about wraps this video up. There was a Tomb of the Dragon Emperor Java title, as well as a now defunct MMORPG, but I made sure to focus on the games that people are most familiar with. Sure, the majority of them fall into a sort of mixed bag category, but the ones that are good are legitimately well-crafted experiences worthy of being remembered, and if you ever get the chance to play them, I highly recommend doing so. As for the rest, they can all be taken out to the desert and left to rot. I'll see you next time.